Hi, this is Peter Schweitzer, and welcome to The Drill Down, where we relentlessly expose cronyism, corruption, and the abuse of power in Washington, D.C. The co-host of this program, Eric Eggers. Eric, how are you? I'm well. I'm a little, you know, I'm having a little FOMO, Peter. I'm yep, having a little, a little yeah, I'm, 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 I'm suffering from, you know, this feeling of missing out because there was this giant party in Washington, D.C., what they call Nerd Prom, the White House Correspondents' Dinner, and we weren't invited we despite were not invited. the rocket success of this podcast. And I know if there's anything I can say about Eric, it's Eric always improves a party. So you should have been there. You, you should have been there. I actually think that's a charitable assessment. It's true. <laughs> it's I think true. it's it's absolutely true. Um, so some very, very interesting uh, comments that Joe Biden made. Of course, the White House Correspondents' Dinner, you're trying to be funny. You're trying to be humorous. But it often offers an insight or a glimpse into what people are really thinking. We think that's the case with Bo Joe Biden because he had some very interesting things to say about the legal uh, threats that Donald Trump is under right now. Let's listen to Joe Biden. I had a great stretch since the State of the Union, but Donald has had a few tough days lately. You might call it stormy weather. What the hell? Trump's so desperate, he started reading those Bibles he's selling. <laughs> then he got to the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. That's when he put it down and said, this book's not for me. So attempted humor there. I mean, got some chuckles, of course, from the media. But there was that little twist about the tough days and a little twist about the legal threat that, that Donald Trump is under. And we're going to talk about that today because... Uh, our contention is, and I think the evidence is pretty clear, is that campaigns are now changing dramatically because what you are seeing is lawfare in action. Used to be in the old days, you ran for president, you needed a pollster, you needed political consultants. It seems like now, beginning in the era of Donald Trump, you also need to hire a bunch of lawyers because the Biden administration has clearly come for Donald Trump. And we're going to lay out today the timeline of how that's actually happened. It's interesting to think about this, this morphine to your point of things that used to be done by the campaign the biden administration is now asking the federal government to perform we did a podcast several weeks ago where we said the every agency within the federal government is now being weaponized as a political turn out the vote operation and that is a thing that used to be the job of a campaign but now it's the department of education is saying hey uh you will give you pell grants but you need to be out uh, registering people to vote and they're targeting voting populations that would disproportionately vote for a democratic candidate which happens to be the sitting president that's problematic it's a departure from how things have done before and we've talked about it and you're now seeing the exact same thing happen to your point uh with the department of justice you you have aspects of the federal government essentially operating as another arm of the biden campaign uh and it's got i think very troubling it projects in a very troubling way moving forward because if this is how it's going to be and everyone's kind of okay with it because it's Donald Trump, what happens if it's not Donald Trump or if it's Donald Trump in charge? Yeah. I mean, in other words, you're saying you can take the criminal justice system and you can weaponize it. And this is a strategy known as lawfare. And it started in the early 2000s. It's really interesting if you see how this transition has taken place. It started in the early 2000s. Lawfare was this new idea. We are going to use the legal system of the United States and the international legal system to go after bad guys like terrorists like Saddam Hussein, like the Russian government. And we are going to weaponize the legal system to try to seize their assets, to tie them up in court. What's happened, our contention is going to be, is it has now been turned on domestic political opponents. That the Biden administration has said, hey, it worked kind of well against uh, Al Qaeda. It worked pretty well against Saddam Hussein. It worked pretty well against Vladimir Putin. Tie them up. We're maybe going to apply this domestically in the United States against Donald Trump. And I think there's pretty ample evidence that there is coordination and cooperation between the Biden administration and these prosecutions that appear to be, quote unquote, randomly occurring around the country. Well, to the point, let's start with who else was at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, mm. in addition to the fawning journalists who are yucking it up with the joke. Then were, everyone applauds when Joe Biden like 
successfully remembers the joke, right, or reads it correctly, and yeah. uh, you know that's a that's a win for the Biden campaign. Was there, was there a Fanny sighting at the? This is wild. I mean, we were researching this podcast <laughs> and just kind of looking for examples of coordination between the Biden administration and the various people who are bringing criminal charges against Donald Trump. And when you search Fanny Willis and Joe Biden, the first thing that comes up is video of her on the red carpet mm-hmm. at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, yeah. which is such a bad look, right? It is. I it mean, is. if she's out, it's one thing for her to be there, but then for her to be celebrated and elevated because she's doing the job of trying to prosecute Joe Biden's political opponent at an event celebrating Joe Biden, at, you talk about like the merger of law enforcement and political campaigns. Yeah. There's no better example than that. No, there there absolutely is. And Fannie Willis is one of those figures that figures into this lo- larger drama. But you, you put together this great timeline laying out. Remember, there are four major lawsuits or, or, or legal actions, I should say, that Donald Trump is facing. All of them seem to have some connection to the Obama administration or the Obama Department of Justice. In fact, some personnel in the, in the Obama administration have actually gone and joined some of these prosecutions. But let's go through the timeline because I think it's so well that you've that you've laid this out, Eric, that shows how coordinated this effort seems to be. And it, it, it kind of merges one of my other favorite stories we've talked about on the podcast, which is Fannie Willis' hiring of her boyfriend to help with yeah. the investigation and prosecution of Donald Trump. And, and that's actually wh- why we know some of the information we know because of the divorce proceedings that, yeah. he, that Nathan mm. Wade had, yeah. to, had to figure out. So uh, so January 2022, Fannie Willis hires Nathan Wade to work on this possible prosecution of Donald Trump. He would eventually charge the Fulton County, that's who she's the Fulton County District Attorney. She would He would eventually charge that office $625,000 uh, in money to, for his work on this thing, which is, yeah. you know, it's its own ethical concerns. If you're paying your boyfriend taxpayer dollars to do this thing, uh, she's going to be able to stay on the case. But, you know, that's a whole separate podcast for a different day as we've done. Uh, and it would later be revealed that she has this romantic relationship with uh, Fanny, that Nathan Wade has this romantic relationship with uh, Fanny Willis. And so we'd get some financial records as a result of that proceeding. Right. So Georgia gets rolling in, in January. January of 2022. They're and, on the case. And remember Nathan Wade, because he's going to have have some interesting conversations with people in the White House coming uh, forward later on. But then three months after that, the New York Times reports on April the 2nd of 2022 that uh, Joe Biden had confided in his inner circle that he believed that Donald Trump was a threat to democracy and he expressed frustration, Joe Biden did, that Merrick Garland, the attorney general, was not throwing the book at Joe Biden. So in other words, you have a sitting president saying this guy who's who was my political opponent, who's going to be my political opponent two years, you know, coming forward. Why is my attorney general not aggressively prosecuting him on the January 6th charge? That's that's a pretty shocking uh, development. And this was leaked to The New York Times by members of his inner circle. And the question is, why was it leaked? The article says that Joe Biden didn't actually talk to Merrick Garland himself. Well, why why say anything to Merrick Garland himself, which is probably its own ethical concern, if you can say it to him via The New York Times? Exactly right. Bingo. And this is a typical Washington, D.C. way to do it, because then Joe Biden can say, I've never talked to Merrick Garland about this. No, I talked to my aides who then told the New York Times, who then published it. Merrick Garland read it, said the president's mad. Maybe I better take action in this area. And the big takeaway is, okay, Merrick Garland's not doing the job. By the way, if Joe Biden gets uh, a second term, which he may, um, Merrick Garland's not guaranteed to be the attorney general in a second term. Correct. It's possible that one of these other people could actually be de facto applying for the job by, by their prosecution of Donald Trump. And so the message is Merrick Garland's acting like, quote, a more ponderous judge. Yeah. Uh, I want him to act more like a prosecutor, specifically over January 6th. So that happens in uh, April of 2022. In May of 2022, Nathan Wade the most romantic prosecutor in Fulton County That's right. uh, travels and would later we know would bill Fulton County for a meeting with White House counsel on May 23rd, 22, as part of his investigation into Donald Trump. Correct. And, so, and here's the interesting question, because I'm not a lawyer. I've never practiced law, but the White House counsel's office is not the Department of Justice. The mm-hmm. White House Counsel's Office works for the president, the office of the president. Why Nathan Wade is actually meeting with White House legal officials has absolutely nothing to do with a federal case. They don't handle federal cases. That's done by the Department of Justice. That is clear evidence 
that there's coordination taking place between the political arm of the Biden administration and this prosecutor in Georgia who's starting to ramp up this investigation and charge him with election interference and a series of ridiculous felonies. This is the one of two meetings we know that Nathan Wade would have with uh, White House officials in November of 2022. He would bill Fulton County for a, quote, interview with D.C. slash White House. There's been some legal chatter that it's appropriate. I mean, this is what you read the context. No, there's nothing to see here. It's totally appropriate because if you're talking about a former president, there's all sorts of unique legal qualifications, what he could get which you couldn't get. I and mean, that's the explanation you read. And about. so you're going to consult the the former president's political opponents, lawyers <laughs> to get. I mean, it's ridiculous because these are different lawyers. Of course, every president brings in their own lawyers. That's an absurd explanation as far as I'm concerned. But so, yeah, in May. So New York Times article, Joe Biden wants more prosecution being done about Donald Trump because he's a threat to democracy. May 2022, Nathan Wade, one of the Fulton County employees who's dating the Fulton County D.A., meets with the White House, one of two meetings he would have. In August of 2022, mm-hmm. Mar-a-Lago gets raided. That's right. So you've now opened up now a third front, right? You've got the January 6th investigation. You've got Nathan Wade. Uh, and now you've got the question over the documents, the classified documents. That raid, this is all starting to take place in 2022. And they all seem to be running in parallel tracks with each other. And they all seem to have the White House and or the Biden administration Department of Justice at the center of them at the same time. And one of my favorite uh, developments that would occur in December of 2022. So yeah, yeah. so you've got... Uh, law enforcement is is engaged, right? You've got Mar-a-Lago is being raided. They're looking into the classified documents thing. You've got Nathan Wade meeting with White House officials. They're, they're trying to build this, what would become a RICO case with what Donald Trump did in Georgia. And then in December of 2022, the number three official in mm. Joe Biden's Department of Justice, a guy named Matthew Colangelo, leaves his job with the Department of Justice and joins the Manhattan District Attorney Office. Now, in the press release in which they announced, hey, we've done this great thing. Here we are in the Manhattan Manhattan District Attorney uh, Alvin Bragg writes, Matthew Colangelo brings a wealth of economic justice experience Mm -hmm. combined with complex white collar investigations. Uh, He's pursued justice against powerful people and institutions when they abuse their power. Uh, It also mentioned in the press release that he worked at the New York State Office of Attorney General where he investigated the Trump Foundation. Yeah. And so here's the interesting thing I noticed about this immediately. Colangelo leaves the number three position at the Department of Justice for a job at the Manhattan DA's office. Now, I'm not saying Manhattan DA's office is a prestigious job, but you are taking a massive step down in the pecking order to go from number three at Maine Justice to working as one of the attorneys at the Manhattan DA's office. Why would you make that move? I would argue other than DOJ, the Biden administration, wanted to have a direct input and wanted to make sure that they had their perspective presented in this prosecution of Joe Biden, uh, his political opponent. I'm not saying you're right. I'm not saying you're wrong. But guess who delivered the opening statement in the criminal case against Donald Trump that was just these past couple of weeks? It was Matthew Colangelo. In Alvin. So, I mean, the guy leaves the Biden DOJ, goes yep. to the Manhattan DA, and then is delivering the opening arguments in the f- criminal case. By the way, first ever time you've had a former president facing these types of criminal charges. So um, if you're looking for evidence that there is at least that the prosecutions in Donald Trump are at least Biden administration adjacent, I mean, that's pretty strong evidence. Yeah, I think I think clearly. And so you see what's happening here, right? You see the fingerprints of, of the White House. You see what appears to be coordination, Nathan Wade calling up, having meetings with people in the White House. You see senior DOJ people leaving and joining prosecutions that are taking place against uh, uh, Donald Trump. And it all seems to be happening at the same time. And then, of course, we move forward to April 8th of 2023, and that's when Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records. This is the Stormy Daniels case. Yeah, right? absolutely. So four months after Matthew Colangelo leaves the DOJ to join Alvin Bragg's office, then they bring these charges against uh, Donald Trump, which again, like we haven't even talked about the merits of the charges. Right. But uh, the Wall Street Journal had, I think, some interesting. Let's just say the Wall Street Journal and other non liberal media outlets are less impressed with the merits of the charges <laughs> right uh, which is pretty crazy because yeah. you know it says that basically they're saying that he paid hush money to stormy daniels right and he qualified it in such a way that he didn't disclose it in his financial records and that they right. know, by doing so amounts to some kind of uh, election interference right 
And so what they say is that, um, that yet the had the payment been made and disclosed via the campaign, the final pre-election FEC reports that were made that year would have been on October 27th, 2016, but they made the payments the next day. And so, but even if he had done it the day before, they wouldn't have been disclosed. So like, I mean, there's a lot of people think the whole premise of these charges are oh, flawed. Yeah, I mean, well, I'll, I'll give you one right here. The claim that this is election interference. So who is interfering in the election? They're saying Donald Trump mm-hmm. is interfering in the election. Donald Trump is allowed, any candidate is allowed to spend as much of their own money as they want on their own campaigns. So what are they saying? That if Donald Trump had donated the money to his campaign and the campaign had paid Stormy Daniels, that it would have been okay? It's a ridiculous ridiculous premise as far as i'm concerned well especially when you have such an unprecedented and historic nature of it right if you're going to charge a former president with right. crimes right like the, they're going to decide this in the supreme court which will matter for generations you know right. is there immunity from certain crimes or not and for it to be about paperwork and money and when was it disclosed when should it have been disclosed when should not have disclosed it right. seems like they should have picked a stronger case uh, because obviously they had a lot to choose from yeah. <laughs> when yeah. it comes to yeah. Donald Trump. By the way, worth also, also pointing out, two other members of the Manhattan DA's office who are bringing these charges, uh, a woman named Susan Hoffinger and a gentleman named Joshua Steinglass, they both previously worked on the tax fraud trial for the Trump organization. So mm-hmm. they've gotten loaded up with these anti-Trump people right. bringing the heat right. against right. Donald Bring, Trump. Bringing the heat. And again, they all have this connection in some way to the Biden administration, the Biden White House. Three months after this charge is brought, he is uh, Trump is charged with illegally possessing classified documents and obstructing the investigation into them. So you see this mounting accumulation. Uh, four days later, uh, Jack Smith indicts the four counts related to election interference and includes charges to conspiracy on on fraud to fraud the United States government and conspiracy to obstruct the official proceedings in, of congressional certification of Joe Biden's victory. Victory. This is the election interference. So yep. that comes four related days related to January sixth. Yes, the, related to January sixth. This comes four days after the claims of the uh, illegal classified information. So you see the accumulation that's taking place of these political actors. This is classic definition of lawfare. This is what they did against Saddam Hussein. This is what they did against terrorist organizations. They're now applying it to a political opponent, which is Donald Trump. And the funny thing is, is that if you ask, I think, people who were at this White House Correspondents Dinner, they would suggest that. I mean, in fact, Joe Biden, in his speech to them, says, you've heard what Donald Trump has said. We should play this clip because he's, you know, he's quoting Donald Trump. It's going to be a bloodbath and it's going to be I'm going to be a dictator. So they literally are framing Donald Trump as a Saddam Hussein type of threat to democracy. Right. Which I think they genuinely believe. Right. And so in their minds, it's justified to treat him that way. Right. But let's also be clear that which one's actually leveraging the federal government to keep a political opponent exactly. from leaving the state of New York and off of the campaign trail. Exactly. And this is the classic excuse that uh, authoritarians or people who want to take concentrate power is they're always doing it in the name of protecting democracy. Right. You've got to come up with a rationale to accumulate power. Uh, and that's precisely what they're doing. So you've got uh, the, the, the situation with the uh, uh, documents, the federal classified documents, the end of July. You have August the 1st, Jack Smith and the January 6th indictments. Then you have two weeks later, Fannie Willis, added, uh, aided by uh, Nathan Wade, um, has 18 RICO charges uh, that are brought against uh, Donald Trump. So again, Again, we know he had meetings with the White House. We know he had discussions. We know that there is this coordination that's taking place. I mean, I guess even if you assume that on the merits of it, they're justifiable. The fact that you've got a current president and his he's worked to help bring charges against the former president, who's his future opponent, um, is, I think, problematic. And it's impossible to separate the political ramifications right. from the legal ramifications, right? Exactly right. And and the other problem with it, I mean, you got to give him credit. This is a, a sinister, but I think brilliant strategy in this regard. Let's say in each one of these legal cases, Donald Trump wins every case, hands down, you know, on appeal or whenever, all cases. It still is a potentially winning strategy because you think of the tens of millions of dollars in legal fees, probably more than 100 million when it's all said and done, that's going to be spent on this. Some of that's being spent by the campaign because they view this as political acts. So you're draining your opponent 
of their financial resources with a campaign. And by the way, you're doing it with taxpayer dollars. You've got DOJ and you've got Nathan Way. You've got all these people that are being paid by taxpayers you're using taxpayer money to drain their campaign funds. The other thing you're doing is you are taking Donald Trump, who, if you look at 2016 and 2020, uh, you made this point earlier. Earned media is how mm-hmm. Donald Trump won those elections. It's hard to generate earned media when you're having to sit in a courtroom uh, the whole time. Uh, and, the, and the case up in New York that's taking place right now, uh, Trump's basically been told if you leave the state of New York, uh, you will be arrested. Um, so he can't go in campaign places. He can't go and he can't and, give speeches that would then be televised. And I think that to your point, they're making sure that the earned media he gets is all in a negative connotation. And it's all Donald Trump and criminal charges are the, right. the two terms that will become inseparable. And the point about the taxpayer dollars are used to do this and bring it back to how we started taxpayer dollars, just to be very clear about this. And this is an objective like this is a real thing. Taxpayer money is being used. Number one, keep a political candidate suppressed yeah. right, and oppressed yeah. Yeah. while at the same time being used to drive turnout for the other political candidate right? because of all the ways in which they're weaponizing the federal agencies to get out the vote in the name of democracy. Yeah. So in the name of justice and democracy, Joe Biden is, I think, giving himself an unprecedented advantage. And like you could say it's really smart and that's just dirty politics and that's how it goes. But then if you if if one of the takeaways from January 6th is that you had a percentage of the American population who didn't think that the election in 2020 was handled or arbitrated justly. Right, right. What's going to happen now? Yeah. Right? I mean, do, do we now expect to say, okay, that he won it fair and square with all the things that are happening as part of the buildup? So if we do have people who raise questions and have a hard time accepting the validity of an election outcome they don't like, it's kind of hard to blame them. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of hard to blame them. And, and here's the other thing I look at is how far – we have fallen in in the standards that Democrats applied. Remember, during the Trump administration, when Donald Trump was president, they impeached him. Why? Because he supposedly had a conversation with Zelensky, the head of Ukraine. Oh, that's right. And saying, oh, the Bidens, you know, they're corrupt. Maybe you should investigate them. Shock of shock, horror of horrors that Donald Trump, you know, whether he was joking, whatever, was saying to a foreign leader, oh, boy, this guy's dirty. You ought to investigate him. That was deemed so beyond the pale uh, that we are going to have to impeach this guy. And yet the current president, Joe Biden, and his administration are using the tools of power to actually prosecute a domestic political opponent. And they say they're doing this in the name of the democracy. It just shows you how the standard has fallen so far. Um, and it's really troubling as as they continue to demonize political opponents. And I've been critical of Trump about stuff, but as they continue to demonize him, to make him this dictator, this threat to democracy, it justifies just about anything. Well, and that's exactly the frame they're using with the media. Listen to how Joe Biden addressed the media at the end of his speech at the White House Correspondents Center, the same White House Correspondents Center, by the way, that one of the prosecutors of Donald Trump attended. A defeated former president has made no secret of his attack on our democracy. He said he wants to be a dictator on day one and so much more. He tells supporters he is their revenge and retribution. When in God's name have you heard of another president say something like that? And he promised a bloodbath when he loses again. We have to take this seriously. Eight years ago, you could have written off it as just Trump talk, but no longer, not after January 6th. I'm sincerely not asking of you to take sides, but asking you to rise up to the seriousness of the moment, move past the horse race numbers and the gotcha moments and the distractions, the sideshows, have come to dominate and sensationalize our, sensationalize our politics and focus on what's actually at stake. And I think in your hearts you know it was at stake. The stakes couldn't be higher. Every single one of us has roles to play, a serious role to play, in making sure democracy endures, American democracy. I am more my role, but in all due respect, so do you. In the age of disinformation, credible information that people can trust is more important than ever. And that makes you, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, makes you more important than ever. Don't take sides. He does not want the media to take sides. That's a dang campaign rally is what it is. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, we're together, right? We're all in this together. You understand the stakes. You've never been more important than ever. Everyone in that room, think of the 
people in the room are the reporters and the prosecutors. Yeah. And, and, and the thing, you know, the, the thing about the bloodbath, I mean, we know he was talking about what was going to happen to the auto industry. The fact that they have to trot out these uh, distortions, complete manipulations of what Trump said, and that's the evidence that they provide mm-hmm. is ridiculous. And the fact that Trump actually served as president for four years certainly did not. He didn't prosecute Hillary Clinton. That's right. right. He didn't go after his political opponents the way that Joe Biden has. Uh, it is a massive uh, reversal that takes place. So um Anyway, we will continue to watch this as we will continue to watch other ways in which the federal government's being weaponized and is being manipulated and is engaged in corrupt behavior. And we appreciate you as always taking the time uh, to listen to this podcast. You can find out more about the research we do at thedrilldown.com. You can pick up my new book, Blood Money, wherever great bookstores uh, are selling it. And you can find this podcast wherever fine podcasts are located. Thanks again for listening. Until next time.